Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Windham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Windham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. Could Connecticut finally legalize recreational use of marijuana this year? We talk with the Connecticut Examiner on their reporting on the issue and see what it means for one of the largest medical marijuana growers in the state. Plus a look at some other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott Smith. Could 2021 be the year that recreational use of marijuana finally becomes legal in Connecticut? If Governor Lamont has any say in it, the answer will be yes, and he's already saying how much money it could make for the towns and cities in the state. I caught up with Anna Elizabeth, a reporter for the Connecticut Examiner, an online news outlet based in southeastern Connecticut, to talk about her recent articles on the subject and what she thinks will happen. Anna, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. Now, one of the topics that has been dominating the news and also your journalism as well is that of marijuana and the possibility that uh, 2021 could see the legalization of recreational marijuana here in the state of Connecticut. What's your sense from all of the reporting that you've been doing so far about what legislators are thinking? Well, I mean, every legislator you talk to will have a different opinion, but overall, most people do seem to think that it is pretty likely we will pass recreational marijuana um, in the state legislature this session. And that's not to say it's a done deal and that everyone's just going to sign on to the bill that the governor proposed, but there are still a lot of things to iron out, though it does seem that the votes are there to legalize recreational marijuana. There are still some really big questions about where the revenue will go and to what degree it will be legalized in terms of possession and sales records that criminal records that people might have, um, to what degree those will be expunged, some of the equity components surrounding who will and won't be able to enter this new recreational marijuana market are still very much up for debate. But overall, the question of whether Connecticut is going to legalize marijuana, it sure does look like, look like yes. The governor in his recent sort of like budget speech, you know, spelled out even some sort of like revenue generating for, you know, for uh, this. He obviously seems pretty hopeful that this is going to pass and and clearly thinks there's a lot of money in it. Yes, that, that did surprise some people. So he released his proposed legislation in concert with his budget proposal, which was on, I believe, February 10th. And when he when he put that out, included in his budget, in his sort of showing everyone how he will be able to balance the budget and bring in enough revenue for the state, he included revenue from recreational marijuana as early as next year. And for something that is currently illegal, that was that was a bit surprising, surprising to some people. But he does just he does anticipate this bringing in a lot of money. The tax rate would be, you know, more than closer to 18 percent. And so that tax rate would bring in potentially tens of millions over the next few years. And he really anticipates using that. So in his bill, half of that would go towards funding pilot and the general fund, which is something that the state legislature and and that Hartford has had a hard time finding money for of late. Um, And then half of it he would have going towards distressed municipalities as sort of a nod to the the equity issues that have been brought up around legalizing marijuana and the fact that the, the criminalization of marijuana has disproportionately impacted certain communities over others. That's a very interesting point because a lot of uh, Governor Lamont's uh, like opponents are saying this has now become a social sort of almost like a social justice uh, issue because of some of the comments that he's made. But I mean, the reality is, and we all know this from history, is that, you know, black and brown communities have been disproportionately hit when it comes to things like cannabis. And, you know, I suppose it sort of, in a way, sort of makes sense. Yes. It, and I think for... It's interesting because he he released this bill 
his proposed legislation at the same time as he released his budget, it struck a lot of the more progressive lawmakers in the state house as as a little bit discordant because for many of them, this is not about money at all. There are lots of lawmakers have told me, I don't care if this brings in zero dollars for the state. This is, it's the right thing to do to no longer lock people up for selling or possessing marijuana recreationally. And I think for the governor, you know, he has also, you know, in his budget address made it clear that that's a priority for him. But this is also very much about dollars and cents and about a state that has been has been struggling financially. And so I think it's it's an interesting tension for needle for him to thread, particularly because a lot of the you know, more center and, and right wing members of of the state house are less interested in what they perceive as more of the social justice components. And then the more progressive folks are really only interested in the social justice components. And getting back to the revenue aspect as well, I mean, the governor made mention about the fact that uh, Massachusetts, one of our neighbouring states, of course, has been advertising extensively here in Connecticut and draws a lot of Connecticut dollars into their state. So I can sort of see why he wants to try and keep that money here in the economy in Connecticut. Yes. And that that is, I think, a big factor behind why so many people see this as inevitable, this session, because Connecticut is simply just simply a little bit behind. I mean, with New Jersey voters having having voted to legalize in November, Massachusetts has been legal. Rhode Island and New York are not far behind. Connecticut really does not want to be out on an island and sending our dollars into other states, helping helping with their budgets and not helping with ours. So while there are plenty of legislators who have been fighting for this for years, I do think at the end of the day, it's a lot about peer pressure. And you mentioned as well about, you know, money coming to distressed municipalities, of which, of course, there are plenty, sadly, here in the state. And we've got them here in eastern Connecticut. Of course, you know, New London, you know, one of the the cities here in, in southeastern Connecticut is a distressed municipality. I mean, And they also do suffer as well from a lot of tax exempt properties there. So this really could be quite helpful to a lot of these cities and towns, couldn't it? Yes, I mean, this, at least from the governor's assessment of how much money this could bring in, it really could mean a lot for these municipalities, especially because so on top of the the state tax revenue that the governor would allocate half of it towards distressed municipalities like New London. Individual cities and towns are also given the option in his bill to levy a 3% excise tax. So directly to the city or town, they could receive a 3% sales tax on top of what the state, what the state puts on. And that, that could mean a lot to, to individual cities. And getting back to that tax as well that you mentioned earlier, I know that some sort of like lawmakers have said, well, you know, if that tax rate is is too high, they they could adjust it. I suppose is that to do with concerns that it could uh, disincentivize people uh, and continue to, to like fuel the black market. Yes, there there are a lot of concerns that such a high tax rate would make it really not even that beneficial to to have recreational marijuana because people who are currently on the black market obtaining mar- recreational marijuana would continue to do that. That being said, though, if you look at, I mean, an 18% tax rate sounds, frankly, crazy high, but Massachusetts has an effective tax rate of 20%. California and Washington are both far higher. So the governor did design this tax rate with with other states and with precedent in mind. But I think that, I mean, while the governor put out his bill, it's not like the state legislators are just taking that and voting. They are very much breaking it down point by point and building up their own proposal. So everything we're talking about now, while it very well could be, could end up in the final bill, the state legislators will craft the legislation that they want and it could end up looking very different. Another interesting thing that's been sort of like put forward is the idea of people being allowed to grow the plants uh, at their households as opposed to commercialized, you know, market. That's an interesting concept. It is. And it is, it is something that there are a lot of strong opinions on on both sides. It's fascinating. You know, I've been interviewing legislators from really all, all parts of the political spectrum um, about this issue. And 
So Representative Candelora, the Republican leader, and many of the more progressive folks like, like Robin Porter actually really agree on this point about homegrown. So from a libertarian perspective, the, I think the idea that the government would allow larger uh, licensed corporations to grow this plant, but not individual people is for some conservatives, very offensive. Um, and then for some progressives, the idea that individual people could still be criminalized for doing something that businesses are allowed to do also doesn't make a ton of sense. But that being said, from what I've heard from, from leadership and from people who are looking at at what, where the votes are on this issue, it does not seem like homegrown is going to make it into the whatever final version of the bill the state house takes a look at. Um, the governor is very much against it. And I think that there are, at least from a lot of more, more center lawmakers, just a lot of safety concerns with not strictly regulating every bit of recreational marijuana that is grown. I'm guessing as well that probably looking at the medical marijuana sort of here in the state of Connecticut, which has been going now since what, 2014, and the amount of revenue that that generates. And of course, you know, coming out of a pandemic, new types of revenue streams are going to be absolutely essential. And um, I'm, I'm very much sure that some of that is driving this. Yes, it is. It is the tricky thing where, you know, for the governor, he really does frame this when he talks about it in terms of equity and he talks about how this is just the right thing to do but he also includes millions of dollars from this in his budget it is something that he feels that he needs to do from a fiscal perspective for the state and i think that that money is is really driving a lot of this even as a lot of individual people say that it's actually just about trying to do the right thing Absolutely. Anna Elizabeth from the Connecticut Examiner. Always a pleasure talking to you. Great reporting by you and, of course, the Connecticut Examiner. And, of course, a story which will continue to be controversial whichever way it goes. We will no doubt be talking to you again later in the year to see exactly which direction this story and this particular topic takes. But in the meantime, thank you as always. Thanks so much, Brian. Always great to be here. Since recording that interview with Anna, a public hearing about legalising marijuana in the state has occurred and brought out two differing comments from local law enforcement here. The head of the state police, Commissioner James Ravella, says he's in favour of legalisation. However, the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association oppose legalisation, citing not having a roadside test available to them to test if someone is under the influence of taking marijuana. <music> Continuing our discussion on marijuana, I spoke recently to one of Connecticut's largest medical marijuana growers, CT Pharma, and asked their president, Reno Faris, about the work of his organization and how legalization of recreational marijuana will affect them. Reno, ever so many thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hi, Brian. Thank you for having me. Now, CT Pharma, you are the president. You wear a couple of other hats as well of this organization. It's one of four medical marijuana growers here in the state. Just give us a little bit more information about what that means. I am the president. I am the COO as well. And I, I am one of the original co-founders. So I've been with CT Pharma since, um, since its inception in 2013. We applied for a license with the Connecticut Medical Marijuana Program. We were one of four uh, groups selected by the Department of Consumer Protection. We were licensed effective February of 2014. We were operational in August of 2014 and delivering products to the good patients of Connecticut by December of 2014. Uh, like I said, we're one of four uh, producers and we are permitted by license to cultivate, process, and extract cannabis to final formulations to serve a patient population that today is around 50,000. So, of course, we're all looking at the legislature. There's the very real possibility that this time it will succeed, that marijuana uh, may well become legalized for recreational use. How will that impact you as a medical marijuana grower? You know, where do you see you fitting into that? So one of the primary concerns and very important to... Uh, the Department of Consumer Protection and the governor is the preservation of the Connecticut Medical Marijuana Program. It is really uh, an exemplary program, one that's admired across, across the United States. You know, we have pharmacists at the center of the patient 
interaction experience. You go to a dispensary in Connecticut, there is a licensed pharmacist who manages that dispensary facility. And that's not necessarily the case in a lot of other medical programs. So keeping the, the program medical is, uh, is, is a top priority. We expect the Connecticut program to continue to grow to about a maturity number of about anywhere from 70 to 100,000 patients. Like I said earlier, we're at about 50,000 patients today. So primary concern is to, is to maintain and preserve the, the medical program. But then once adult use does happen, we're seeing all types of numbers projected from various sources on what the, uh, the participation might be on a, on a retail dollars level. I can say that CT Pharma's job will be to sort of stay the course, producing quality products you know, pay at an affordable price, safe products that are standardized and typical of what you would, you would expect in America today from a consumer packaged good, because at the end of the day, that's what we are. You know, with all the mystique and the magic and the, and, and the excitement about marijuana, you know, at the end of the day, we're a consumer packaged good. And, you know, a consumer pays, pays for the product and they have expectations. And it's our job to meet those expectations. Let's talk about, you know, the product a little bit more specifically people may or may not be aware that the marijuana that a majority of people use today, either recreationally, um, maybe in other states, and certainly medical, it's a lot stronger than the stuff that's like the boomers use, wasn't it? Oh, it's very, very different. Uh, and that's really a, a testament to, to, the, to the breeders over, over the decades who have, who have selected for particular characteristics specific cannabinoids, uh, you know, THC, CBD, CBGA, et cetera, and also the terpenes. The, that's what gives the, the cannabis its, its, um, its odor, its smell, its aroma. You know, a strain probably in the 1970s, good marijuana might have been 2 to 3% THC by weight. Uh, that number could have gone up to about 5 or 6% in the 80s and the 90s. And I can tell you today, you know, routinely we see strains anywhere from 28 to 36% THC by weight. So it's you know, much more potent today than it was even 20 years ago. So what's people's attitudes like today with regards to marijuana? Because, you know, we're in the 21st century, 21 years into the 21st century, yet we're still having these debates about this drug, which has been around since time began almost. I think the average person is, is comfortable with, uh, with marijuana, the adult use, the recreational use of it, uh, you know, so long as it's, it's limited to 21, you know, to 21 year old and older, similar to beverage alcohol in the United States. I think everybody's okay with, with that portion of it. I don't think it's scandalous anymore. I mean, we're reading now there are different states that are contemplating approving, uh, you know, psychedelic mushrooms. That's happening in, you know, in Massachusetts. I just read an article over the, over the weekend that they're thinking about at least decriminalizing it, not necessarily proving it or, or you know, regulating it as a legal, as legal CPG, but, you know, at least decriminalizing it. You know, the war on drugs is, you know, didn't sort of, to say it failed is kind of harsh, but it, it kind of did. Um, maybe, you know, possession of certain drugs, you know, can be regulated, decriminalized, maybe a fine if somebody's caught dealing. But I think we've come a long way in realizing that we, there shouldn't be sort of criminal punitive consequences for the use of recreational drugs. Now, obviously growing um, the marijuana um, plants, uh, you've got a very, very big facility. In fact, I believe you are now the biggest marijuana grower in Connecticut and probably one of the largest ones in the United States. This doesn't come at a cheap cost, does it? No, uh, our building, we have a, a very nice building here. We're very fortunate to, uh, to purchase it. It's 216,000 square feet. And it has really tall, high ceilings, so we can double deck it, if you will. We expect to be over 300,000 square feet of cultivation space, which definitely does put us as one of the uh, largest indoor medical companies uh, in the world. You know, this is public record. We bought the building for $7.5 million, and we've probably put in almost double that in, you know, renovating it and investing in the lighting and the security and the controls that you need to run you know, a legitimate CPG company. One of the things, if I'm reading this correctly, that the legislature is looking at, and if, as I say, marijuana does become legalized for recreational use here in Connecticut, is that 
the state wants to be able to have a variety of people stroke organizations, you know, get licenses. And in particular, they're looking at areas of the population which have been overlooked in the past. I mean, what sort of thoughts do you have about that? Like I said, you know, the cost to do this, I mean, you've just mentioned how much you've spent, obviously, on the building. I mean, obviously, there's security issues as well, even if it becomes uh, legalized for recreational use. And then, of course, you know, there's all the growing fees, etc. I mean, what are your thoughts generally about all of that? You know, Brian, it's, it is a business at the end of the day, you know, we have employees and, you know, we have payroll and and health insurance and 401ks and insurances and we pay taxes. So at the end of the day, it really is, it's, it's just like another type of business. And I would love to see uh, participation from the groups that have been sort of excluded from participating over the years. I I know that there is a very competent group of legislators who are uh, working up and up at the Capitol to make sure that that all the groups, all the relevant groups are are accounted for and in participation. So, you know, we're, we're keeping our eyes open and being supportive wherever we can. And we're really not opposed to anything. I'm not speaking on, on behalf of the producers. I'm not saying that they oppose anything. I'm just saying that I, I, today I'm speaking here today is Reno Ferries from CT Pharma. And, you know, we're supportive of the job that, uh, that the folks up in Hartford are doing. And, and we're on standby to, to, to help however we can. Are there any things in particular that you would like to see form part of maybe the legislation or have you been asked your thoughts, obviously, as one of us, say, the major sort of uh, growers of of medical marijuana here in the state? Well, because we've been growing and processing products for going into our eighth year now, we are asked on occasion our opinion on, on various topics related to manufacturing and processing and transportation and just sort of because we've been doing it, you know, all along. But, uh, you know, short of that, every once in a while, we'll submit an official position, you know, on behalf of our, our producers association. But like I said, we're not in opposition to anything. We're actually very supportive. Do you also think that, um, again, if this does come off this year, that it's actually a slightly better situation that, you know, Connecticut is sort of uh, a little bit later to the party, as it were, because it's had time to then look around at other states that maybe legalise recreational use, you know, earlier and, and you know, can possibly pick up on some of the, the, the negatives and the positives uh, about how those states dealt with it? So, Brian, the, the challenge for Connecticut is really the way our, our Connecticut government is, um, is structured. In, in states like, you know, Massachusetts and in New Jersey, they put it to a popular vote. And, you know, it was a, it was a ballot initiative. And, you know, how many of the voters are in favor of it? And, you know, it was a majority was in favor of it. And uh, the bill passed. And then it really, it was the onus was put on the legislature to develop the regulations and, and sort of the way that it would be regulated and taxed, et cetera. But really it was a popular vote that, that brought it in. Uh, in Connecticut, we don't have ballot initiatives. So it would really, it, the way that it would sort of get passed would be as a bill, the way it is, it, it's, it's attempting to pass through the legislature today. And um, it becomes a little more complicated because it's not just a matter of do people want adult use marijuana in Connecticut because they do but it becomes, how are we going to tax it? What are we going to do with those tax dollars? How are we going to make sure that the groups who've been disenfranchised are participating in a fair and equitable way? And then when you start adding all those different components, it becomes a little more difficult for it to pass as efficiently. Uh, I think it's June 9th we have to get the bill through to the legislature or it's um, the bill expires. So there is as, as an element that we're up against the clock too. During a year where we're in the middle of a pandemic, and, you know, a lot of the, the sessions are, are via Zoom and, uh, you know, it could have been a challenge even in a, uh, even in a, in a year where there wasn't a pandemic, just, you know, there are complications that sort of just add to, to making it even a little more difficult than, say, New Jersey or Massachusetts might have experienced. 
Final question to you, and thank you ever so much for your time. It's a little bit of a $64 million question. Obviously, there is a lot of money in this industry. I mean, you, you've made that clear. Is this really a case of the state of Connecticut is maybe rushing into this a little bit too quickly because we have, you know, we, we find ourselves in a pandemic situation for over a year now, and and this could be it's like a very easy slight stream of money for them for, from a revenue point of view? The, the champions of the bill have made it pretty clear that it wasn't about the revenue. And that's what we, that's what we hear, that it's a really a matter of, you know, adult use marijuana is here. Marijuana is in Connecticut. It's around us every day. Folks can get in their car and drive up to Massachusetts and participate in an adult use program there and uh, come back to Connecticut and use their marijuana. So we're hearing that it's really not about the tax dollars, that it was just something that folks want it. You know, we should be able to, to uh, vote it in and to regulate it and to tax it and to just move on. I don't know that really that the state is relying on those tax dollars to really make that, that huge of an impact on the, uh, on the things that we, we need to be worried about as a state today. You know, it, like I said, it, it's really a matter of it's here and let's just sort of tax it and, and regulate it and, um, and just sort of live with it and move on. And at least that's what we're hearing. Reno Faris, the president of CT Pharma. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you ever so much for your expert insight into this as obviously one of Connecticut's major uh, medical marijuana growers. And uh, we look forward to seeing what the outcome of the uh, the legislator's uh, decision will be later this year. But in the meantime, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Brian. <music> Green Valley Tree LLC is proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week. Contact Green Valley Tree LLC for all your tree removal and plant health care needs and more. Find us at GreenValleyTreeWorks.com or call 860-234-4041. Time now for a look at some of the other stories making the headlines in the region recently, sponsored by... The Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling is a nonprofit organization which, through advocacy, prevention, and education, is here to support individuals and families who are impacted by problem gambling. Our helpline, 1 888 789 7777, is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We also have live chat and tech support through our website, www.ccpg.org. In the Connecticut Examiner this week, a lack of clear data on how the COVID-19 vaccines can affect women who are expecting or nursing a baby leaves these women in a difficult position when deciding whether or not to get vaccinated. Dr. Christopher Morosky, an assistant professor and OBGYN at Yukon Health, said he understands these concerns and he said it's a shame that Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson did not study the vaccine's effects on pregnant women. In the day this week, roughly 4 in 10 Americans say they're still feeling the financial impact of the loss of a job or income within their household as the economic recovery remains uneven one year into the coronavirus pandemic. A new poll by the Associated Press, NORC, Center for Public Affairs Research, provides further evidence that the pandemic has been devastating for some Americans while leaving others virtually unscathed or even in better shape at least when it comes to their finances. In the Norwich Bulletin this week, the Town of Plainfield Planning and Zoning Commission has unanimously approved a site plan for a planned Amazon distribution facility after lingering questions concerning sidewalks, traffic and sight lines were addressed. The Commission's vote marked the last major town-level hurdle for the project and clears the way for permitting and eventual construction by BL Companies for the Exeter Group, the project's applicant on a section of the former dog racing track at 137 and Lathrop Road. In the Middletown Press this week, when pretty much everything goes online, pretty much everyone needs to be able to get online. The public will soon gain access to a reliable Wi-Fi network free of charge in two areas of Middletown as part of a state-funded program aimed at municipalities with high numbers of unconnected households. And in next week's Connecticut East this week, as Governor Lamont eases some COVID-19 restrictions for businesses and outside events, we talk with Goodspeed Opera House and their two new leaders on how they will be continuing to adapt to the current COVID situation and trying to bring back performances both inside and outside the theatre. 
That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at Connecticut-East.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East, where you can also listen to the show again on demand. And please like, follow and share on your social media platforms too. I'm Brian Scott-Smith. Thank you for listening. 